Hello, thank you for joining us at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. I'd like to wish a happy Mother's Day to all of our all of our mothers who are here with us today or who will be watching us online. This is our Mother's Day service and we're going to be uh, starting right off. I'll get right into it. The text they're going to be using is in Psalm 100 and chapter 27. The whole chapter is only five verses. We're going to be reading the entire chapter. If you have your Bibles uh, ready, you can get them open to Psalm uh, chapter 127. The title of the message today, I, I've actually um, toyed around with numerous titles. The title of the message today is going to be a Mother's Day message for all parents for radical parenting. A Mother's Day message for radical parenting. Uh, some of the other message titles I thought of were uh, uh, Parenting with a Purpose or Parenting with a Plan because the sermon is going to be on the plan of how we should want to or our plan for how we as parents uh, are going to be raising our children. Even though this is a Mother's Day message, uh, we are gearing it toward all parents because parenting is an equal role all the way around. Uh, we'll have another one similar to this on Father's Day, men, so I won't leave you out. Um, so I'll be able to get the moms on Father's Day as well. But if you have your Bibles open, uh, you can have them to Psalm 100. Ah, I can't even talk today. Psalm chapter 127. The goal of our service is parenting with a purpose or parenting with a plan or radical parenting. And I want to say to everyone listening that this message is just as applicable. My wife had to just step out of the room with our, with our littlest one, Juliet, because she's acting up. She'll have to be listening to us in the other room that we use as our nursery. Uh, but this message is just as applicable for, or applicable for moms, for dads, who have parents of a little baby like that, or of a, of a small child, or even of a teenager. Or perhaps those of you who haven't even had kids, uh, kids yet, but you are planning on maybe having kids one day. Because parenting is something that all of us in the community, in the Christian community, need to have a role in because it is bringing up the next generation of children and is something that we all need to have a part of. Psalm chapter 127, verse uh, beginning of verse 1, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The verse that we're going to be going off of in this chapter is verse 3, Children are a heritage of the Lord. And let's pray. Dear Father God, I thank Thee for sparing our lives on this side of eternity another day and for giving us the opportunity to be here to, uh, for me to preach and for those listening to hear Your Word. I pray... Pray thee, Lord, that you will guide my lips. Help me not to get tongue-tied. Help me to be able to get the message across in the way that you need it. And I pray that it will be a blessing to those who are here listening. Hide us now behind the cross, uh, Father, and fill us with the power, the power of the Holy Ghost of God. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and just for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Children are a heritage of the Lord. This verse, this chapter that I just read to you is God's perspective on bearing children. Children are a heritage of the Lord. And it says that the fruit of the womb, in other words, that child that is born unto you is God's reward to you in life. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to your Bibles, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read verse 27 and 28. It says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish, or fill the earth, and subdue it. Sorry, I just flipped over my notes for no reason. God created man in his own image. It says in God, he blessed them and he said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and fill, replenish the earth. God says to the man and women, I want you to be fruitful. 
I want you to multiply and I want you to fill the earth. And he says that children are a blessing. He also says they're a responsibility. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 5 through 7 we're going to read as well. Deuteronomy 6 verses 5 through 7 it says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Talking to parents. And he says, And these words which I command this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them while thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and while thou risest up. This isn't diff a difficult passage of Scripture to understand. And by the way, it's repeated in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and Luke chapter 10, verse 27. He says that the first commandment, the first thing, parents, the first thing that you need to do is, I want you to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And he says, I want to you to teach that diligently to your children. He says, when you sit in your house or when you walk by the way, this is in your day-to-day -day activities as you're sitting in the house with them or sitting at the table for, for dinner around the dining room table or just walking in the house and when you're out and about in town in your day-to-day -day activities. And he says, and I want you to teach them with all their might, with all their heart, with all their soul, when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed, with everything they do to love God. Parents are to teach children to love God. Children are a blessing. They are a privilege from the Lord. They are a responsibility. My question for you parents is this, on this Mother's Day message. Do we look at our kids really as being a blessing in our lives? Or do we look at our children and think of them more as a burden? We live in an age today that I am going to call the unwanted generation. The unwanted generation. It used to be back some 20, 30 years ago that families would a average um, two to three kids per family. Um, some families more, some families less. Some families have nine. Uh, some families uh, would just have many, many children. But today that average is actually less than 1.5% closer to one child per family. The, the number of children on average that families have in this day to day. We live in an unwanted generation. That's why there are over 1.5 million abortions in the United States of America every single year. Over 1.5 million abortions. Some of these statistics that I'm about to share with you are a little hard to find. I had to dig a little bit. In California alone in the year 2011, in the state of California alone, in 2011 there were 181,730 abortions. Which, by the way, was more than 10% of the entire country. California, with more than 10%, it was actually 12%, 181,730 children were murdered. Anyone have any guesses? Oh, by the way, I just in my statistic, that was actually down 9% from the previous year. The previous year was 9% more children that were murdered in the state of California. Can you guess? Anyone have an idea what the second highest state was? Anyone? New York, that's right. In 2011, there were 92,300 abortions in the state of New York. 92,000. This is just covering the United States. This isn't even counting all the other countries in the world, which just about all of them, abortion is legal. People would say, well, Brother Spencer, you're not even considering things like rape and incest and murder. I mean, you know, so I'm not even going to get into a philosophical debate with you on whether or not those things are okay and would justify an abortion. I'm just going to simply state that out of those three together, rape, incest, and murder, that that accounted for less than 1% of all abortions that take place. Less than 1%. The remaining 99% of all abortions is simply because the parents or the mother just didn't want the kid. 
They just didn't want their child. Sure, it was okay to go out and have sex, but the consequences of having sex, children, was not something that they were willing to tolerate. That's why teenage suicide today is increasing at a rate of over 300% annually, not because of abortions, because of being unwanted. Abortions are because the children are unwanted. Kids today, once they're born, for those who don't get abortions, many feel unwanted. And teenage suicide today is increasing at a rate of over 300% annually. You know why kids are taking their lives? Because they don't feel wanted. They don't feel wanted. They don't feel loved. They don't believe anybody wants them. We give our kids the wrong signals. When we, when, we, ah, when we say, goodness, I can't talk today, I apologize. When we say things or make them feel in a such a way that they are an aggravation. Or if we say things that say, you are an expense to me. Or you have interrupted my career. And we say those things to our children. Career mom today, God bless you if you are willing to put your career on hold to stay home with your children in those ever so important highly impressionable preschool years, those years one through five, if you will stay home and put your career on hold so that you can stay home and be with your children up until they can get up into those, into those school age before you resume your career again. That is such an important time in your children's life. And if you, will, if you will put your career on hold to be able to be with them for that, it is such a blessing. But how terrible of you if you keep beating into their head that they've interrupted your career and ruined your life. And God forbid that dad come home from work and complain about the expense of that child. And what an aggravation that child is. These signals are devastating to send to your children. Did you know that 85% of a person's personality is formed between the ages of 1 and 5. 85%! Not when they're an adult. Not when they're a teen. Not even during their elementary school years. 85%! My children listening to here, right here today, Scarlett, you're 6 years old. You have already got 85% of your personality developed that you will be for the rest of your life. And the signals that we give them during these years, one through five, parents are very important. The question for you today is, Mom, Dad, do you believe that children are a gift from God? Do you believe that children are a gift from God? And if you do, how does that affect the way that you are parenting? How does the way we parent line up with the way that we believe that our children are a gift from God? I would like to believe that everyone listening to me today would say that your children are wanted, that they are part of the wanted generation. And I would like to believe that those people listening to me and watching me online right now, that the reason that you are listening is because you believe that your children are wanted. You want your children. But if we are going to say that we have loved children in our families today, and I would like to believe that we have loved children in our families, then there is a responsibility, uh, responsibility parents, in how we love our children. And I want you to sit and just listen to me very carefully. Mom and Dad, be careful. Be careful in your parenting. Because the way that the world has taught you is the right way to parent does not line up with God's view on parenting. The world's view on parenting is very different than God's view. The world's view says this about parenting, raising children. If you love your children, you are going to give them the best education. It says you are going to give them the best clothes that money can buy. These are clothes that are going to make them popular with the other kids at school. Name brands, top of the line. By the way, parents, some of you mothers out there, you'd be willing to let your child, your daughter, 
spend a week in hell if necessary if it make them a little bit more popular just to just to be able to get them with more with the in crowd i'm talking about the way that i can look and i can see um my kids at school who the ones that were in public school no longer are they there uh, all of our kids now are homeschooled but there was a time with some of our older kids they were in public school and they'd be in school concerts or something and we would go up and we'd see how those those 13 and 14 year old girls would come up with their short mini dress on and, and the way that we dress our kids today moms and dads I, i'm just i'm focusing on the moms because i'm thinking of daughters with this illustration just the way that you would allow the things that you allow your kids to dress in order for them to be popular the world's view says they need to be popular the world's view says that you are going to put your kids in all of the extra curricular activities you are going to have them involved in sports you are going to have them in the school choir you are going to have them in the orchestra or in the band you're going to let your kids be in the drama club and you're going to have your kids involved in all the extracurricular things and all the activities that they can do because as a result if they do that they will grow up to be socially acceptable and they will fit like a glove into our current society and therefore they will be a success be careful the world's view on parenting is not God's view the world's view on parenting is not God's view. Oh, we want our kids to have character. We tell them. We say, son, I want you to have character. But the problem is, mom and dad, I'm not sure that many of us know how to help our kids resist temptation and to live godly lives and make right decisions. We want them to have character, but we do, do we know how to tell our kids how to resist temptation? and how to live good godly lives and how to make right decisions deuteronomy chapter 6 that chapter that i already read it, it says it, 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 there's one thing that it says to me where it's talking about teaching your kids while you're while they rise in the morning and while they're in the home during the day and while you're out and about and when they go to bed at night and it, it says one thing very clear to me that teaching our children must be a lifestyle it's the only way to look at it. If I'm going to teach my kids to be good and make right decisions and live good, godly lives, then it first has to be a lifestyle with me. It has to be a lifestyle with me. How can I do it? How can I teach my children? How can I do it when I get up or in my profession? How to be a lifestyle when I go to work or when I come home and how, how for it to be a lifestyle. And when I put my kids to bed at night, it has to be a lifestyle first with mom and dad. It takes a lifestyle, mom and dad, to give your children a godly legacy. God created the home and the family circle to, the be, to be the ultimate teacher or conductor of Christianity to the next generation. God didn't make the church for that. The church does teach that, and the church is important. And it's important for us, it's important for you listening to be to church. If this is where you call your church home, it's important for you to turn in and listen to the sermons so that you can get that spiritual food in your life. But the number one conductor that God created for teaching the next generation of children to be Christians is not the church, it's the home and the family circle. Mom and Dad, have you ever heard the statement, and I've heard the statement, says that raising a child is like baking a cake. You don't know that you have a disaster until it's too late. Have you ever heard that? Well, that's not true. You can know you're raising a disaster. You can take a look at how your child is behaving, and you can know that you're raising a disaster. Or you can know you're raising a success. You don't have to wait until it's too late to find out. You can know by the very principles that you instill in them when they're young, starting at the beginning. For mom and, moms and dads listening today, I am calling you to make a radical commitment. This message, one of the titles I said was talking about was called Radical Parenting. Radical is something, it's a change from the way that things have been done before. It's a change. And I am calling for you, moms and dads, to make a radical commitment in the raising of your children. And as I am preaching... I know that there's no possible way I can get this all together in one sermon. So I'm going to attempt to get the first two points. I've narrowed it down to five. Five 
radical priorities that I'm going to be discussing with you on our kids and raising the standard and having a parenting plan and purpose in how we're raising our children. I'm going to be sharing the first two with you today and the next three in the following service. And I'm going to get right into a priority number one. Priority number one is called radical selflessness. Radical selflessness. Our goal and our theory in parenting says that our kids are all important. But in practice and principle, is that what they really are? Or do we say something differently? Let me repeat that. It's easy for us to say to ourselves that our kids are number one. It's easy to say that. But our practice, what we do, is what defines us. That's what really reveals how important our kids are. When God gave my first child to me, my daughter Jeannie, I believed that God was giving her to me so that I could help her grow up and raise her up the right way. But I've discovered in all of these years, Jeannie and the eight children that followed her, that by giving me all of these children to raise, that God wasn't really using me to help them grow up. He was using them to help me grow up. Because as I, I as a dad have had to do a lot of growing up in these last 24 years while I've been raising my children. I've had to do a lot of growing up. As we brought five now up into adulthood, one still a teenager, three more still haven't even hit their teenage years yet. You know, and, and kids have a way of making us grow up. There was a bumper sticker. I didn't see it, but someone told me one time. They saw this bumper sticker, and the bumper sticker said, My kids saved me from toxic self-absorption. And they need to do that. Because we tend to get absorbed in ourselves and our own little worlds. Our kids have a way of getting us out of that, and they need to do that. Radical self Selflessness. Dads, let's talk. Let's let the rubber meet the road. And I'm saying this to dads because I'm a dad and I can relate to you as a dad. But this doesn't just have to be a dad because this is a Mother's Day sermon. And moms, this can be equally important just to you. It doesn't have to be dads. It can be to moms too. And listen to me. I'm talking about something that in my personal life, this has application to me because when I was looking at this, this one hit me right straight in the eye. Dads or moms, I'm talking about us who will climb the career ladder 18 hours a day and pursue sports and hobbies with a vengeance, sit up all hours of the night when we get home playing video games, and have a long other list of things that we would like to do, and all of that is done at the expense of our children. I'm talking to you moms and mothers on this Mother's Day who place your kids in a daycare center but not out of necessity. You do it for self-fulfillment or to achieve a higher standard of living. I worry about this higher standard of living mentality that is rampant in our society today. Uh, I, I've talked to people when I... I when I do marriage counseling and young couples and they're getting together and even older ones when I talk to them I tell them and I, I said this back when I gave marriage counseling to my daughter Jeannie and her husband Nick I sat down with them and I said listen to me when you get started out nobody has financial problems because they don't make enough money people have financial problems because they live above their means they spend more than they make this higher standard of living mentality where kids, right as they get out of high school, they want to have their apartment fully furnished and a car and all of this stuff and they get into debt, into debt up in the, to the wazoo because they're trying to get all of this stuff, this higher standard of living. It's how people get into debt and financial people, uh, problems come from. We live in a day where the carrot is dangled before our eyes at every turn. And if we're not careful, parents, we will sell our children down the river for a higher standard of living. And we excuse it, working all those long hours, taking all those jobs, mom and dad both having to be out, working out of the home. And we excuse it by saying, we're trying to do something and make something better for them. But in reality, we're not giving them something better. We're giving them something worse. 
They don't need the higher standard of living. They need us. They need us. Amen? I mean, come on. Amen? Amen. I, I can get people to say amen. You, you listening online, will you at least say amen? Come on. <laughs> Children need us. Amen. They don't need the higher standard of living. We have bought into the big lie. The big lie says you can have it all, but you can't. You can't have it all. You can't have everything. Let me ask you today, parents, are you raising your children to be missionaries or mission fields? Let me repeat that again. Are you raising your kids to be missionaries? Or are you raising them to be mission fields? I believe many parents will sit in church week after week after week, and listen to sermons and messages just like the one I'm preaching to you now. But we don't take that and we don't instill it into the lives of our children and our kids to grow up to be the very mission fields that we're trying to reach. Because we haven't raised them to be missionaries or simply kids who will live godly Christian lives and, and learn to honor God with their life. We haven't raised them to do that. So for all of you parents out there listening who will make a radical decision to practice radical selflessness... Can I share with you what I believe are some radical commitments to radical selflessness? Radical commitment number one. Parents, moms, dads, we need to commit to making our family a higher priority than our career. We need to commit to making our family a higher priority than our career. That's a tough one to swallow, mom and dad. Especially for those moms and dads who have worked so hard to make your career everything in your life. Let me read you, or actually I won't read you, I'll just tell you about it. I was reading an article just the other day. I found it online, the March 1997 issue of Fortune magazine. I found it because I came across the cover of the magazine. I'm not, I don't have the cover to show you, so I'll just describe it to you. The cover was this, was this businesswoman. Um, she was dressed in a three-piece suit and she looked sharp. Uh, she was sharply dressed. She was done up nicely. She was heading out the door on her way to work. Um, standing behind her is a little toddler with like a, a sad crying face. And that toddler is holding on to her mother's leg. And that the mother is trying to break away from the toddler. And she's got her briefcase in one hand and her purse in the other hand. And she's trying to get out and get to work. And then the caption underneath it says, Sure, businesses say they value families. But here's the the dirty little secret. And if you go on and you read the article, the essence of the article is that the reason that there's no family values, or that there's bad family values today, is because of all those bad companies out there. But listen to me. Bad family values don't come from bad companies. Bad family values comes from families. It's not the company's fault. Don't look to the company to provide a way for you to promote your family over the world. It's up to you. Family values come from families, not from companies. If uh, and, you know, um, and I like you parents. Have you ever seen the movie called Hook? Steven Spielberg movie called Hook? It's a wonderful movie. Go watch it. In fact, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Go watch the movie Hook. If you don't have it, rent it. Look up Netflix. It's whatever you get. You can find it. Go find that movie Hook. I'm not going to tell you what it's all about. If you haven't seen it, just watch it. Even if you have seen it, go watch it again. In fact, go sit down with your children and all of you sit down together and watch it with your children. Make it a quality time experience. Go watch that movie, Hook. It is not a Christian movie. It's a family movie. It's okay for your kids to watch. Not a Christian movie. But it does have some excellent examples in it of a parent who is so obsessed with his career and the family and what it means to them because of the things that has happened. Go watch that movie, Hook. That's your homework assignment. And I hope when I see you again for the next service, you've already watched it by then. Radical selflessness says, I will commit to making my family a higher priority than my career. I will commit to making my family a higher priority than my career. Radical commitment number two. 
and this is under radical selflessness, it says, we will establish a lifestyle based on the husband's income and avoid debt that makes it necessary for the mothers of preschoolers have to work. That was a little long. I'm going to give that to you again. Radical commitment number two. Parents out there, I want you to make this commitment that you are going to establish a lifestyle based on the income of, your, of the husband, of the dad. So that if there are young children in the home under school age, that the mothers do not have to be out to work and they can be at home during those early impressionable years. We will establish a lifestyle based on the husband's income and avoid debt that makes it necessary for mothers of preschoolers have to work. You say, well, what if I'm a single parent? What am I supposed to do then? I'm the single breadwinner. Single parents... Listen, please listen to me and don't get mad at me and don't turn me off. I know that you're doing it by yourself and I know it's hard, but even if that's the case, you still have to make your family a priority over your career, even if you're the single breadwinner. You have to you have to realize that you have to take on the role of both a mom and a dad. And I know it's hard and I know it's tough for you single parents to be able to make it. And, and all these things that you're saying, and Brother Scott, I just, I, I can't do it. I'm a, single, I'm a single parent. I have to work. I know it's hard and I know it's tough, but you have to find a way. It is so important to your child. Even you know, if you have to put him in daycare because there's no other solution, you're going to have to make up for that when you're at home. You're going to have to put your life on hold. You're going to have to deny yourself in order to be with your child every moment that you can be with them and spend that quality time with them. My, there's a lady that I uh, work with at Michael's. Um, she has a four-year-old daughter. She, was, uh, she had to work on Saturday and she was anxious to get off of work. And I just casual conversation asked her what she, what she was doing that night. And she says, I have plans with my four-year-old. I'm taking her to a park. And that woman, she is recently separated from her husband. Her husband was very abusive. They're going through a really tough time. They are not Christians. They are not saved. But she, as an unsaved woman, still finds a way to be able to work by herself. And she gives almost every waking moment that she has to that little four-year-old girl. Parents, it is highly important. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. But you have to do it. Further, you have to realize that even though you have to work, that that child's schedule that is so important and you have to make that a priority. Some of you mom and dads, you're not, even, you're not doing as well as some of those single parents out there. Some of you mom and dads, you are so up to your ears in debt that you, both of you, are out of the home working around the clock just to be able to pay for the, the bills that you have. And listen to me, when you have that kind of debt, that is a problem and you need to get some debt counseling. You need to swallow your pride and get that debt counseling and figure out how you can get that in line and set. If you have to get rid of some stuff, maybe you have to get rid of your car and get something that's not as expensive. Whatever needs to be done, you need to get that done and you need to get that taken care of. It is not worth losing your child in the process. Trust me, your children need you. They don't need that so-called higher standard that you're trying to achieve. Radical commitment number three. Radical commitment number three is I want you to write down your family values. Take, get, get it, and even you know, if you're here in church, you can even begin doing it. Just get a pencil and pen and paper and write down your family values. What is it that you as a family value? And when you're done, I want you to take last year's calendar, take a look at that, and see if those values line up to the way you lived last year. What is the priority and what are you what is it that you want to do? Does it line up to what you're really doing and are you living to what you're saying is a priority to you? Parents, I want to simply ask you in this first radical priority, are we dying to self so that we can be the parents that our children need us to be? Here's the commitment. The commitment that we need to make is this. I'm going to make it a higher priority of raising my children unto the Lord than anything else that I'm doing in my life. 
I'm going to make raising my children to the Lord a higher priority than anything else I do. And, I, and listen, I need to tell you as pastor of this church, I have a greater commitment to raising my children to the Lord than I do to pastoring this church. There are times between working at Michael's, I also have another business. I'm an artist. I have an art studio. I, I haven't even had time to even work on any art projects because between working at Michael's and working at this church, I am stretched thinner than I can even describe. I mean, the stress of trying to find a way to be able to do it is unreal. And, and there are times as a pastor, the different things that I would have to do, and people come to me. People come and they want, you know, they might need some counseling and they might want me to drive an hour out of the way because they don't want to leave their house. They want the counseling brought to them. So I might have to drive an hour out of the way to see someone to counsel them. Or they would say, you know what, my, my home is in disrepair and they think that the church is going to just help them with that. And so they're like, I need a roof. And they would like the church to not only come by and pay for it, but you know, provide the labor and everything else. And I, with roofing experience, I used to be a roofer, I used to do construction. People say to me all the time, you used to be a roofer, I need a roof, can you do it for me cheap? Or they would say, oh, you do construction. Can you do some construction work for me? Listen, I don't have time for any of that. I can't help people with their construction. I can't help people with their roof. If people need counseling, really, folks, I need you to come to me to do it. I, okay, if it's important enough to you to seek out counseling, you should have a priority that you are going to make it an effort to come and see me. Okay, because I have obligations and stuff that I have to do and I can't run around although all of you would like me to do that but I can't run around like that all the time serving other people because I can't do that and parent my kids at the same time I don't have the time or the resources or the energy to be able to do that and I have to make parenting my kids a priority and listen to me, if it's important for me as the pastor of this church to make that a priority, it's important for you as a parent to make your kids a priority over the job that you currently have. Amen? Amen. That's a priority, and you need to make it a priority. Your children are more important than your career and more important than your job. You say, well, I own my own business and I have to put in all these hours. Listen, those kids are your business too. And you own those kids too, as much as God has allowed you to own them. And they need to be the priority over your business. Selflessness. Selflessness, parents. Let's not be selfish in this. Let's be selfless. If you're going to have kids, make kids a priority. And let me just say to you, if you're not going to have, if you're not going to make your kids a priority, then don't have them. If you're going to have kids, make your kids a priority. Radical priority number two, and this is the last one I'm going to share with you today because of time. We need radical objectives in raising our kids. Radical priority number two is radical objectives in raising our kids. I heard this little saying, and it's very true. And parents, write this down if you're taking notes. I heard the saying, it says, we've exchanged putting a backbone in our kids for putting a wishbone in our kids. People put these little things out on Facebook and you see them. But that's what we've done. It's very true. We've exchanged putting a backbone in our children for putting a... A, a wishbone in our children. We, we give our kids, we have this thing, we have a, give them a wishbone. It's like, whatever you wish, want it. I mean, Christmas comes along and you just, whatever you want. Wish for it and it's yours. I'll just, I'll give you everything. I'll just give you all of this stuff and all of these toys and we give all of it to you. And you say, well, well, I want to give them everything because I love them. Listen, that's one of the worst things you can do. That is horrible. Whatever you want, you'll get it. That's horrible, parents. Absolutely horrible. You say, well, when they're young, I can buy them things and I can do that. Yeah, you teach them that. And then when they get older and older, it's going to be too expensive. And there'll come a day where you can't afford the toys. And when they get out on their own, they're going to be just, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And they'll just go to get it, and they'll rent it, and they'll do it. And before they're even 20 years old, they'll have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt credit cards and they'll be working their tail off and won't even know what to do. Be careful, parents. 
We live in a day where it says whatever feels good, do it. That's the society we have. Listen to me, parents. We are raising the guardians of tomorrow's church. That's what our kids are. My kids here, you are the guardians of tomorrow's church. You take a look in this world, I mean, pretty much all of us would say that this world is a mess. Every liberal Democrat out there will just blame conservative values. However, if you go back 20 years, it was a whole lot better than it is now. And 20 years ago, we thought it was horrible then. Now it's just utter chaos, confusion. Boys and girls don't even know what they are anymore. And society says that that's fine for you to do. And just confusion and chaos and free money. And, you know, you know if, if you have a problem with something is, riot and burn things down. And that's just called peaceful protest. Just confusion and chaos. Why? Why is this world such a mess today? The reason is, is because the last generation failed to raise the moral guardians of this generation. And the moral guardians of this generation aren't enough to be able to stand up and make a difference anymore because the last generation failed. Failed completely and dropped the ball. If your parents, if you're listening to me and you're older and your kids are grown, gone, take a look at how they're living their lives. I hope they're living for God. Many of us have failed. We dropped the ball. And now the rest of us are all left with the pieces. And what are you going to do, parents? How are you going to try to fix it? Are you going to try to fight the lie? Or are you going to buy into it and just make it worse? Question for your parents. Why can we tell little difference today between the Christian kids in the non-Christian kids. Why is that? Have you wondered? Mom and Dad, why is it hard to tell the difference between our teens and the world's teens? Why is there such a total resemblance in the way they talk, the way they dress, the way they walk, the music they listen to, their whole lifestyle? Why is that? Why is that, parents? We need some radical objectives in raising our kids. And in a moment, some of you listening to me are not going to like me very much. And you're not going to like what I'm about to say. But I would not be doing my job if I didn't share these things with you. Parents, we need to give our kids a godly vision. I believe one of the problems in our kids' lives is that they don't receive a godly vision from us as parents. And they don't have a godly vision for living godly. Because our, our kids are going to look up to us as parents to de uh, determine what things are right and wrong. And, and if we don't have a godly vision, then we can't give that to our kids. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 says this, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. Let me just explain that a little bit. Charity, that's brotherly love. The end of the commandment, this is what we need to be teaching our children. The end of the commandment, this is it. The final end is love out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience. That means a good godly conduct, the way that you live your life, and of faith unfeigned, faith that does not waver. Faith in God that does not waver. We are to love others and live holy lives. That's what we need to do as parents. And we need our kids to grow up thinking that that is the way to be. We need our kids to, have, to learn how to have relationships with others that are pure and healthy relationships based because of that godly vision that we give them. Parents, do, you know, do your kids know how to have good and wholesome relationships? relationships and how to do they even know how to build a relationship some of you are saying well my kids don't have any friends or my kid none of them want to be friends with my kid well parents listen i have something to tell you that's got something to do with your kid if your kids don't have any friends either anywhere at all there's a reason for that and part of that blame lies with them what could that be from? Maybe it's because of what you're teaching them or what you're not teaching them. You haven't taught them how to be a friend or how to build a relationship. 
Some of you might say, well, they could be friends with some of them, but they're not the top of the pecking order, or uh, they're not the upper class kids, or they're not the popular kids. It's a, you're, you're teaching them the wrong thing there. Parents, come on. We need to teach our kids how to forgive and how to be forgiven. How to keep a promise. And we need to teach them how to live holy lives. Let me tell you something. Your kids' IQ is not important as important as their CQ. You say CQ, what's that? Their character quotient. Their character quotient. How much character are you raising in the lives of your kids? The Greek philosopher Heraclides once said this, a man's character is his fate, and it's true. If you show me a man's character, I'll show you his fate. So here are some radical objectives on raising the standard for our children. Radical objective number one. What is going to be your standard on sexual involvement prior to marriage? Mom and dad, what is going to be your standard on sexual involvement prior to marriage? Say, Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to address something like that. I mean, I'm embarrassed that you even brought it up now. Okay. One question. How much excitement should you allow your child to have with the opposite sex before it becomes unholy? If you answer that question, that'll tell you where that line needs to be. How much excitement should your child have with the opposite sex before it becomes unholy? The sexual relationship is one of the most incredible relationships in the entire world. But it is not meant for your child prior to them getting married. Mom and Dad, don't get caught up in this safe sex bunk that the world is trying to teach your children. Don't get caught up in the idea that you can have free love and free sex with everybody what you want just as long as you keep protected so you don't get a disease. Listen to me, you may be able to keep your kids' bodies from falling apart, but you will ruin their mind. God says safe sex is sex after you get married. Mom and dad, please be careful on this. Raise the standard here. What is your standard on sexual involvement prior to marriage? I talked with my girls about it. I talked with my boys about it. I talked with my, my son David. My son David was in a courtship for several years with a girl at our old church by the name of Jasmine. And I talked with David about it. I talked with, with uh, Jasmine's parents about it. I did. I sat down with Jasmine's parents and I talked to them about what the standard was going to be. I discussed holding hands. I did this. I teach my son how to hold hands with Jasmine so that when he was holding his hand, holding her hand, he didn't get his hand on the other side of her hand and his arm on the other side of her arm so they could be somewhere and touching places on her body and touching things that they ought not to be touching to keep them from getting excited about things that they ought not to be getting excited about that uh, at that age so that the unholy so that the sorry so that the holy does not become unholy come on parents now talk to my girls about it if your boy dates one of my girls i'll talk to him about it say you're crazy preacher no i'm smart I don't want either of them to get excited about anything and this kind of stuff at this point on their lives so that the holy becomes unholy. Come on, parents. Get on the stick. This world is a lie. This sexual promiscuity going on in society is absolutely destroying family values. Can't you see that? Can't you see what's going on? Can't you understand that? My son Matthew recently got married. 
He's in the Navy now. He's stationed over in Okinawa. His poor wife is back here in New York because she can't go over with him. I don't know if, if he kissed her or not before they got married, but I do know from the testimony that he told me that they did not do anything or get out of line at all before they got married. Matthew... Basically, he said to his wife, Alyssa, he said this, and I would wish, this is the thing that I would want all of my kids to be able to do at some point in their lives when they stand up there and they're getting ready to marry their spouse, be able to look them in the eyes and say with a clear conscience, I have saved myself for you. That I've done that. That that was important to me. I wanted to save myself for you. I used to live in Florida. I was stationed in the Navy down in Florida back in the mid to late 1990s. And I remember uh, Jeb Bush, the brother of former President George W. Bush, was the governor. I remember hearing him make this statement. He was at a preacher's meeting. Jeb Bush is, is a Christian. Someone asked me, if we get behind and support you, are we going to come out and regret it later? And he's like, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, basically, is there anything, any skeletons in your closet? And, uh, and Jeb Bush's response is, well, I don't know if the media or 2020 or one of those things couldn't find something out. Is, is there anything you want to know in particular? And one of the preachers says, yeah, there are, have there been any other women in your life? Jeb Bush made this statement. He was around 38 years old at the time. He said, I have been faithful to my wife for 38 years. And then he said, what I mean by that is when I was growing up, my mother, that was former First Lady Barbara Bush, my mother taught us saying, son, when you grow up, save yourself for the person who will one day be your wife. Give her that most important thing. Save yourself for that. And he says, so I did that. I wanted to be faithful to my wife my entire life. I've only known my wife. There has never been anyone else. You know what? That's the kind of politician that we need in Washington. But that's the kind of way that we need parents to raise their kids. And that's the kind of kids we need to be. It doesn't just start at Washington. It starts in the home. Mom and Dad, be sensitive about this. When you talk to your kids, be sensitive, but be straight up on it. What is your standard on sexual involvement prior to marriage? Second radical objective I'm going to give in raising the standard in your homes is this. Parents, how about raising the standard on movies, television, entertainment, and the Internet? You say, now you're meddling, preacher. It's fine with me. I'm okay with that. I want to ask you a question, mom and dad. How many curse words will you hear? How many times will we see Jesus Christ blasphemed? Or how many sexual encounters will we watch before we get up and leave or turn it off or quit going? Folks, Hollywood and the TV and the internet and the entertainment industry is incredibly against anything that the Word of God is for. I remember talking with one of my kids. They're on their own now. They're, and, and by the way, they're not living for God. I'll be honest with them. They're struggling at the moment. But I remember talking to them and they wanted to share with me a video that they saw on YouTube. And I just asked, well, what's good? Does it, is it a clean video? And they said, it only has a few cuss words, Dad. And, and I said, Th think about what you just said. It only has a few cuss words. And some of you listening to me, you're sitting here all self-righteously. I can't believe the preacher's son would actually say something like that. But you're going to go home and, or, or be at home later this week and turn on some old reruns and watch reruns of Seinfeld or Big Bang Theory or some garbage sitcom or some other garbage or filth that you put on TV. And you are going to sit there and laugh your full head off. Folks, can't you see how we've degenerated ourselves? My word. What are our objectives on raising our kids unto the Lord? 
You say, Pastor, if we, all do, if we do all these things that you're talking about, there's going to be a lot of things our kids can't do. <laughs> Duh. Took a, took a long time to figure that one out. We're indulging in too much of this. We say, oh, that was a good movie. It only had one nude scene. Come on, folks. When are we going to raise the standard on television and the movies and the Internet? Let's raise the standard. Let's have some radical objectives and let's make a decision that this is what we're going to do. This is the way it's going to be. The last radical objective I'm going to give you when I close. Let's raise the standard on the language in our home. What do you mean by that, preacher? Well, I don't, I don't mean swearing, but I do mean that at the same time. I'm not talking about just swearing, although swearing is a part of it. Definitely, there shouldn't be swearing in your home. But what I mean is, what are you willing to say, brother to sister, sister to brother, children to parents, parents to children or husbands, and, excuse me, husbands and wives to each other? We dropped the standard in this area. I, I listen to how some of your kids behave and I see them sit there and, and I back talk the parents and, and then the parents just sit there and insult the kids and I just think to myself, oh, woe is me. Actually, I should be thinking, woe are my kids. Because your kids are going to grow up and ruin it for my kids. Woe are my children who have to be the guardians of the generation that you're bringing up lost. We need to stiffen up here. We've dropped the standard in this area. Let's raise the standard on the language in our home. And it gets back to the basics. You know, there's a good principle in teaching your kids to call dad, sir, and mother, ma'am. That's a good principle. You say, that's old-fashioned. I'm not that strict like that. Well, maybe that's the problem. I teach my sons, my daughters to call me sir. Don't I? Yeah? Sir. Yeah. <laughs> I, teach my, I teach them to call me sir. They're mom, man. They do it. They hear it in my voice. Sometimes I might start to lose my temper and they quickly shape up. Yes, sir, is their answer when I ask them a question. But what does that do that? What does that do for them? Why is that is that old fashioned? No, it's not old fashioned, I'll tell you why. Because it teaches them respect. It teaches them how to respect authority. And if you don't teach your children how to respect authority early on, they're going to walk all over you parents when they're older. They're going to walk all over their employer. They're not going to be able to hold a job down. They're going to be disrespectful and abuse you and abuse others when they grow up, all because of what you did with them as a child. Mom and Dad, please be careful here. I was doing a marriage and family series with another guy. There was a guy at church who was going through a tough time and his wife, so he would come up to my, to my home after work and we would sit out in the car where we had some quiet and I would do a marriage series with him. And, and one of the things that he said to me is, we were talking about some Old Testament verses like the ones I gave you here today. And he's like, I don't really get too much into the Old Testament because we live in the age of grace and we have Christian liberty. And, and some people would say that, don't we have Christian liberty now and be able to get away from some of this old law? But, but, you know, but what this guy was doing, he was he was taking thoughts, and what some of you are doing now, you're taking your thoughts of Christian liberty, and you're using that to be justified being conformed to the world. But the Word of God says in Romans 12, 2, 12, 2 it says, Be not conformed to this world, but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he continues, So that you may be able to prove or try out or live what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is what God wants you to do. We are not to be conformed to this world. We need to be transformed and live for God and live holy lives. In closing, I want to say to single parents and blended families, and, and, you know, these radical priorities must be a priority with you just as much as they are for the, the, the homes that have two parents in the home. And, and blended families, this can be extremely hard, especially 
if your children that you share a home with have a non-Christian home as their other home. These radical priorities that I'm giving you can be extremely hard because you're going to be laying the law down and the other home is going to loosen up and they're going to let your kids run everywhere. But you as the parent in the home, you cannot back down. You cannot back off and say, well, I don't want them to do that. I'm going to ease up here. You've got to lay down that structure. You've got to lay down that standard. I know it's hard. Oh, believe me, I know it's hard. But you've got to do it. And trust me, by doing that, it is going to give them a grounding that even if they're not living for God and they're on their own, they will be able to look back and they will be able to know that there was a standard and that I had parents who loved me and parents who cared for me and tried to keep me away and out of these things. I know it's hard, but God will help you. God has resources for you and he will help you. Don't give up. I'm going to close with this short test for you. There are three other radical priorities I want to give you. The first two we did today, radical selflessness and radical objectives. There are three more. My test for you is this. It has two questions on it. Question number one, what are you doing next Sunday? And it has, for at its meaning... What is your priority on selflessness? Is there some other activity that you're going to be doing next Sunday that's going to keep you from coming back to church to get three more priorities on how to be able to raise your children unto the Lord? Or are selflessly you are going to put those other activities on the back burner and make coming to church and getting three more objectives a priority? Question number two is this. What are you doing next Sunday? And that goes along with our second priority, radical objectives. Is getting three more radical priorities to raise the standard for your kids going to be an objective for you so that you're going to make, an, an, uh, make it an objective to come back to church next Sunday? I encourage you to be with us for the next service. Parents, I encourage you to come back. The suicide note read, Mom, I am sorry I was ever born. It seems I have ruined your happiness. I've chosen this way out so that you can be happy again. That note is repeated hundreds of times every day all across America. That young lady who wrote that had lived with a babysitter ever since she was born. She got rides to and from school from others. She was given her allowance and given her freedom. Not a single parent home, just parents that were too busy for her. Time with her was an intrusion. They didn't see her as a blessing from God, but a burden, not a heritage, but a hindrance. They conveyed that message to their daughter, and she responded by taking her life. Mom and Dad, radical selflessness, radical objectives. These are our imperatives today. For our invitation today, with everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around, Listen, I run an internet church. Obviously, you hear me talking to people, and we do have church here. And we are opening it up here as, as the COVID restrictions are loosening. If any of you are in the Bath area and you would like to join us for church, um, sometimes I'm out visiting other churches. Sometimes we do other things. So I would just, you know, and, and I still manage to get the sermons up and online. But if you would like to visit our church in person, just contact us via, uh, via our website. The name, uh, the email numbers are on there. Contact us and let us know you'd like to come up and visit our church. And then we will make it a radical priority that we are not out visiting somewhere else so that we can be here for you on that day but uh, even as those of you who are sitting at home watching me and I say as your heads bowed and eyes closed and you sit there and think oh this is stupid I don't need to bow my head it's it's all online it doesn't really matter you know what this this church it's an online church it's for you who can't come out and, and to get into those places of the world where the gospel can get no other way 
other than through the internet. This is a this is a time between you and God. If you are watching this service or listening to the service, and this is the church service, the time that you have, this is between you and God. And God is watching, and God is looking at what your attitude is. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would anyone with a raised hand say to me, or, or testimony to God, I am a Christian. I know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I know I'm going to heaven. Would anyone be able to say that? Anyone in this room that you raise your hand as a testimony? I see that hand. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you. I see your hand again. Still, God bless you. And still up. But perhaps there's someone who, who does not feel that they know the Lord as their Savior. Let me tell you, that's the first step. As we're trying to talk about radical objectives and, and raising your kids to the Lord, the first step you need to do is get the Lord into your life as your Savior. That is something, that is a highly important thing that you need to do. And in a moment, I'm going to pray for you to do that. And if you pray that prayer with me, and you mean it with your whole heart, Jesus Christ can come in and save you even on this day. But that's the first priority that we, we need to do. Those of us who are saved, and, and thank you for those of us who raised, raised your hands as a testimony to the Lord that you're saved, but how many parents listening to me online would say to me, Brother Scott Spencer, I have not been toting the standard in my home. I have let things slide. The things that you have talked about today, I have not been meeting the standard that God wants me to be. And I need some help with that. Would you, with the raising of your hand, as a testimony to God, say, I need some help. Brother Scott, I need you to pray for me. And for all of those who have your hands raised, God bless you. God bless you. We need to make this standard. We need to make this change. If you would like to get saved and know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to pray right now. If you've watched any of my other sermons, I've explained to you the difference between repentance and head knowledge and heart knowledge. You have to know not just the head and the, the, the words to say on how to get saved, but it's a commitment. It's a decision that you make. It has to be in your heart. Even as parents have talked about these things, if you have been raising your kids differently and you need to make some changes in the home and you're going to have to crack down on that standard, that's repentance. That's turning from what you were allowing before and making a decision that you're not going to do it again. And that's the same thing with getting saved. If you want to get saved, you have to turn from your sins and forsake them. Repent. And accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you want to do that today, I'm going to pray with you right now. I'll pray out loud. You pray in your heart. And you would repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross to save me of my sins. I would like to repent of my sins now and receive the Lord as my Savior. I am turning away from my sins and I'm not going to do them anymore. But I am going to make the decision. I'm going to live my life for you. Lord, if I mess up, and I might, and I will, please forgive me in advance. Help me to be able to make this decision and help me to live my life for you. Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and forgive me of my sins and save me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And for mom and dad, you want to make some radical priorities and some radical selfless decisions, then pray this prayer. Or actually, I'm, I'm not going to pray for you to pray. That's something between you and God, but I'm going to pray for you. And then if it's selfless enough for you to do, then pray that God will enable you to make these commitments. Lord Jesus, for moms and dads who listen to this service and want to make some changes, I pray, dear God, that you will give them the courage and I pray that you will give them the desire. And I will pray you'll give them the fortitude, especially if they have teenage kids. When they start laying down this standard and these laws, there's going to be some rebellion. And it could be hard and it could be tough. But Lord, help them to see that it is vitally, absolutely imperative that they make that commitment and they make that decision. 
Lord God, would you please be with them and give them strength and courage to stand up and live for God with their lives? Would you give them a godly vision that even as they have allowed things in their home, that they as parents would cut that stuff out of their life and make the decision that they are going to live their lives for you so that they may live their lives for their children, so that their children may see a godly vision in their parents. Please, Lord, be with parents, be with moms and dads, and be with their kids, Lord, and help them to be able to turn their lives around, get right with God, and start having a godly heritage. Please, Lord, be with parents, be with moms, be with dads, be with them on this Mother's Day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you all for coming to join us at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you, and I pray that God will be with you as you go on your way. Take care. Happy Mother's Day, everybody, and God bless.